Mike. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, hello. Hello. <laughs> hey, hello, everybody. Welcome better. to uh, Pencil to Pencil, uh, your favorite soon-to-be endemic podcast. Uh, and, Mike uh, yeah. is representing with his fancy lid. Hello. Well, hello. <laughs> I think you have to you, have a covering on your noggin for that to work. You may no. not be able to tell, but Jamar Nicholas is not here this evening. Uh, Jamar, uh, our, uh, our... Sunning our... himself <laughs> on the beach. He is working on the next Leon book this evening, and he's probably watching right now, so I'll, I'll try to behave myself. But Leon... Uh, the extraordinary, almost a protector of the playground. The the name of the uh, the semi prequel. The uh, the uh, what would you call that? The minor league version of it. This is the major league version. That was, that was sort of like the uh, the uh, well, not I guess not the ash can because it was like the whole enchilada. Yeah, it was. It was. It was it, it's a great book. It just uh, you know it wasn't. They they saw that they loved the idea and the Scholastic picked it up and turned. And uh, let him turn it into this, which is just beautiful. Uh, but Jamar is on assignment. And so uh, he'll be back. He'll be back in, uh, I think he said. Three, three weeks? Yeah, a few weeks. But the hope is between now and then, we can push ourselves over 1,000 subscribers. So if you're here, you're watching on YouTube, or if you're over on Facebook and you're watching, head on over to YouTube.com slash Pencil, T-O Pencil. Hit the subscribe button. Uh, we'd like that to be a, a nice surprise for when he comes back. Become but, one of our town criers. March through your neighborhood with a sandwich board and a bell. You know, pencil to pencil, hear ye, hear ye. Pencil to pencil is live. You know, we promise we'll bail you out if you get arrested by the police. <laughs> well, my name is Steve Conley. I'm a web cartoonist. I write and draw the webcomic The Middle Age, which you can read at middleagecomic.com. It's on Webtoons and Tapas and Go Comics and all these wonderful places. And uh, I would be remiss, I believe is a phrase, is the trademark phrase. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not introduce the Tower of Power, the Man of the Hour, too sweet to be sour, the magnificent, the marvelous Mike Manley. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, as they say, and all ships at sea. Um, uh, it's been a busy, it's Wednesday, but it's been a very busy week. But I have other news, which is that now will be a trifecta because I have been accepted into the National Cartoonist Society, like my two fellow co-hosts, Jamar and uh, Steve. So uh, now we are the strength of three national cartoonist society i have to pay my dues now but <laughs> <laughs> you've been paying your dues for a long time yeah right? yeah, yeah but it, it's funny because for a long time i i didn't i didn't uh join for decades literally for decades um but the last couple of years i've been getting a lot of like oh come on man join join them when the new guys are in it i figure oh what the hey and they've also changed the I guess the policies are really pushing to get a lot of new cartoonists in. You know, cartooning has changed quite a bit in the last five or six years, I would say, you know, because of the rise of the, there's so many people doing comics, but they're not doing comic books per se. There's a lot of web cartoons, a lot of young cartoonists. I mean, there's, it seems like there's literally hundreds of cartoonists producing work but you don't you're not going to see it in your local comic book store right and and the, and the national cartoon society was pretty weird in that it was a very elitist organization uh, elitist might be a rough word for it but it was very comic strip centric and back and it was set up when the comic strips were making all that money and so they they was like if you they had a criteria where if you're not making a, uh the majority of your income from comics then you weren't really a professional cartoonist and so you weren't you know, it was one of the requirements of entry. Um, and then they, they lowered that to it had to be a substantial amount because I'm sure some of them had turned into, re, into uh, uh, you know, uh, landlords and <laughs> real estate tycoons with all the comic strip money they had. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think that when it formed, I mean, literally, these guys were 
the height of celebrity. I mean, Al Cap or uh, any of those, you know, Milton Kniff, any of those old time cartoonists were as famous as any actor today because newspapers were the dominant uh, media of communication. And everybody read comic strips. And not like little kids, they read it, but millions of adults read comic strips every day. And it's sort of hard for people to imagine. Uh, maybe the last cartoonist people might think of, even though he's been dead probably of almost a decade, is Charles Schultz, where he was sort of like a household name. Right. You know, um, because I don't, I think people, even though they knew Calvin and Hobbes, I don't think they knew Bill Watterson. No, I don't. He, I don't think he ever. I don't think he was ever. He ever put himself out there in that way. I think he let the work speak and specifically kept to himself. So I don't yeah. think it, it wasn't like Charles Schultz who would go out there and, you know, beat the drum for Peanut. Yeah, I have vague memories too of when I was a kid, the Mike Douglas show, which was a sh actually produced here in Philadelphia. It was a national talk show, and every once in a while he would have like a cartoonist on and I have vague memories as a kid of them, you know, having some guy drawing something. It might've been Milton Kniff. It might've been somebody else. Um, but uh, uh, so yeah, they really changed the policy. I think they're trying to get a lot of young cartoonists uh, to join uh, because I mean, mostly it was like old white guys, you know? Yeah. That was the majority of the people who were in the National right. Fortuna Society back in the day. You know, you had millionaires who had houses in Connecticut. <laughs> yeah, and they they, they have their Rubin Weekend, where it's uh, this is where the Rubin Awards given out. And Rubin's a, it's a weird award because it only it's it's weird because when you go to the Eisner Awards, all the awards are handing out. Well, most of the awards they're handing out all evening are the Eisners, and if you go to the Ringos, most of the awards they're handing out are the Ringos. But if you go to the Rubens, there's only one Rubin award and everything else is a division award you know for comic strips or greeting card artwork um and it's a, a it, when they go to the awards it's all tuxedos it is it is still i think that's like the, maybe a little bit of the flavor of the olden times where it's still highfalutin it, it's really interesting i can't imagine that at any at the ignatz awards at spx or something like that yeah there's still i i saw pictures this year um and there are still people get for that one, I guess event they get, they get they wear their, their black and white. You know they wear their tuxes. You know. Yeah. Um, so if I ever go to one of the uh, ceremonies, I guess I'd have to rent a tux because I don't have one. One of the most awkward things was I got nominated in the uh, web comic in the online comic short form category in for the National Cartoonist Society Division Awards, not the Rubin, but. Uh, and it was the first year of lockdown, uh, American lockdown. Um, and so, uh, there weren't any real public gatherings. And so their, their, their way of solving the problem of having an award show was to have everybody record an acceptance speech as if you had won. <laughs> <laughs> so, and they would play the one of the person who won and which is, is it definitely a way to go? I'm not sure if it was ideal. I couldn't record it in all honesty. I couldn't be like, you know, it was it was more like going, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate it. Because I, I right. you know. Is it so. like, it's like uh, when they had the Super Bowl, they print the winning shirt for both teams. And then <laughs> exactly. the one that loses, they just send to like a third world country. They just like air yeah. drop, you know, 100,000 t-shirts. Yeah. You know? They're still warm. They're still absorbent. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I mean, these people don't know who the Dallas Cowboys are or what a Buccaneer is or whatever. But hey, you know, I got these free T-shirts. So what made you decide to, to join the National Cartoonist Society, Mike, after all those years of not being in it? Uh, well, uh, partially because both you guys had joined. And uh, a friend of mine, Richard Green, like every year kept saying, come on, come on, come on. So I said, well, you know what? I joined for a year because i i know back in the in the day um probably in the 80s i thought about joining but it was also a very different thing because i remember al 
Williamson was in it, and then I think he dropped out of it. And they were not as friendly to comic book guys. No. Yeah. It was mostly like comic strips and, in particular, humor strips. So, uh, but I decided, you know, what the heck, I'll, I'll, I'll join for a year, see how it is. Uh, and Philadelphia has a pretty active chapter. I think it, uh, the the usefulness of it as a cartoonist. I mean, people go, "What's what's the practical reason join the, to join the NCS?" You at first, I thought, "Okay, I'm going to join this," and I'm okay. Now I'm in. Where's the big online forum where all us cartoonists can talk shop or something like that? To me, that would be the useful thing, uh, and that doesn't exist. Uh, well, I think there's, there's, do have one. There was I couldn't do it because I forget what I. Well, it might have been because we were doing the podcast. There was one national one in the last fall where they got like people right. all over. And then there's the local chapter Zoom meetings. Uh, yeah. So I think that's something that they're trying to work on. Because again, like a lot of these older organizations, you know, uh, they're mostly manned by older or more retired people, they're not good with technology. So if you get yeah. younger people in, they go, okay, I know how to do Zoom. I know how to do this. I know how to do that. So it's just like second nature for somebody who's in their 20s to use the technology in a way who somebody's in their 70s or, you know, might go, oh, I don't, you know, how do you, what? What's yeah. their, their sense of their uh, way of communicating was through a magazine, a monthly magazine that they would mail to people. It's like a very old school, like ARFB. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and but they do have benefits, like they do have a table. They table at the New York Comic Con and the San Diego Comic Con. And if you're a member of the NCS, they they'll you can say I'd like to get I'd like to be set up for an hour or so at the show. And you know, as a fledgling cartoonist, you might never be able to get a table at one of those big events. So you can dip your toe in and check out the event and say, I'm going to be on my, you know, I'll be at the NCS booth from, you know, one to three on Sunday or something like that. So that, that's really helpful to have. Um, but other than that, there really isn't a lot. Oh, but, and the next best thing is about it is they have very active local chapters. Philadelphia in particular is a very active one. I think Washington DC has a very active one. Um, and so if you're in a city and we're in a big metropolitan area that has an active community, it's a great way to meet a ton of other cartoonists. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I think there's so many young cartoonists that probably all these big centers uh, will grow. These chapters will grow. So I know they're making a big, a big push to it. And I think they have tiered too. So if you're a young cartoonist, but let's say you're not making a lot of money, they have these different tiers that you can join for cheaper, you know. Yeah, and I, th and I think there's also yeah, yeah, there's a much there's a very inexpensive rate for people under 27, something like yeah. that. If you're so, uh, well, I, I tell you what, I don't want to. I was going to maybe talk about a few of the news items, but I want to get into tonight's topic. Uh, no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go are you ahead. sure? Okay. So, one of the things we talked about last year, we talked about it quite a bit, was the discussion around AI imagery. And one of the big events we haven't talked about that's just really happened in the last few weeks is a lawsuit, well, multiple lawsuits, but one in particular was brought about, were brought by uh, three artists, including Sarah Anderson, um, who is who does Sarah's Scribbles, very popular comic. She's a Ringo Award winner. I think she's maybe a Harvey Award winner as well. Um, uh, very a, a great cartoonist, a very popular cartoonist, but sh uh, she's one of the plaintiffs in this case against the company which is behind, you know, the the uh, the, the big AI engine and Mid Journey and uh, Mid Journey is mentioned in it, and as is Deviant Art, and so they're bringing a lawsuit against that um, for having their work stolen. Uh, it's an interesting case. If people want to check out the video by Legal Eagle, he breaks it down. Uh, I think he tries to be fair to it. Uh, it comes at it from a not artistic point of view um, or a non-artist point of view. Uh, worth checking out. So Legal Eagles video is 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 the one I'd recommend. It's again, it's a primer. It's not a great. Um, I don't know it doesn't dig in deep, but he also talks about a lot of the the history of copyright law and the history of, you know, he goes back to when it was an actually an argument is a photograph something you can copyright. But it, there's an even much more recent case which he cites, which is what uh, is it. 
which is informing whether or not AI can be copyrighted or copywritten, which is um, that case of the person whose cell phone was taken by a, 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 a monkey or a chimp in a zoo and the, the chimp took a photograph of itself. And the case was who owns that photograph that was taken? Does the chimp own it? And the, uh, <laughs> I think PETA was arguing that the, the, the ape owns the photograph. But the ape, of course, is not a person, right? But he couldn't get it because it's because the 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 concern is authorship, and that so far only people can be authors, and only people. So by ex, you know by extension, only people can be artists. So uh, that that <laughs> that monkey case is uh, informing this AI decision. Scopes monkey, the famous Scopes monkey trial. <laughs> <laughs> So it's really interesting, but check out uh, Legal Eagles video on it. I think it's worth looking at. But I also like that it was a cartoonists at the uh, as part of the process. Yeah, well, I think that um, when it comes down to people losing millions of dollars um, for copyright infringement, because one of the things about copyright infringement is if you copyright your work and then it is stolen, infringed on. You know, there's all these uh, categories, and each one, there's a fine for the abuse for each one, right? So yeah. it just starts tallying up and tallying up and tallying up, and probably what will happen is they will probably have some way of you saying, A, I don't want my artwork used, right? And so you won't be able to use certain hashtags. Like if you type in, you know, Steve Connolly, it goes so boom, just like it won't, it won't work. Right. In the style of it might be a forbidden phrase to put right. into it, right. one of those yeah. entries. Yeah, any, and I'm sure it'll be like any deviation of that name will not, or that term will not work. Well, it's also really interesting because you can't copyright style. And so uh, you know, because someone said, I really want a Jack Kirby illustration. They could hire Mike Manley to make one. Um, uh, well, but it's I interesting. Just, like, could could an AI create something that looks like Jack Kirby if it's not allowed to import Jack Kirby images to begin with? Well, right? you know, there's so, that, that lawsuit with uh, Huey Lewis and uh, Ghostbusters where they wanted Huey Lewis to do the theme for the first Ghostbusters. And he said no. And then they went and got, um, what's his name, uh, to do... Uh, uh, Ray Parker Jr. Ray Parker Jr. And they showed, you know, like how he basically copied Huey Lewis's thing. They they won, they settled out of court, and then Huey Lewis screwed up by divulging some part of it, which then Ray Parker sued him. Oh, but, my goodness. Yeah, but and there was another lawsuit. I think I talked about this before. Where it was Frank Sinatra, and they wanted him to do an ad, and he wouldn't do the ad. And then they hired somebody to sing like Frank Sinatra. So there is precedent for saying, "I don't want to do this product," and then someone blatantly imitating your style. The problem with Jack Kirby, the problem with a lot of this stuff is that, and I actually entered my name into that, have you been trained? Web, uh, it's a website where you can enter your name and it will say whether your artwork has been used by one of those AI programs. And some of my artwork had been, but the fact is I don't own that artwork. Now, whether I drew it or not, I don't own it because it's owned by Marvel or it's owned by DC. They right. own the rights to those characters. They own the rights to that artwork. I right. don't own the rights to the artwork. Now, if I do a sketch or do a drawing, that's all mine. But right. anything I have ever done for any corporation is not owned by me. Right. Right. So you don't have, because no. you, you don't, you have, don't even have the, you, you can't defend it. It's not yours to defend. Right. right. So, that's a very interesting question because somebody like Jack Kirby, who spent, you know, the bulk of his career working for other people, he did have his own corporation. So I guess it's like it was based off of what Fighting American and, you know, some of the other stuff that he did with Simon. 
But if it was based off of anything he did for Marvel, anything he did with DC, he does not own the copyright to that. So literally, you could imitate him. But I don't think he would be able to sue you. The corporation could sue you. Right. But then again, I don't know. It's like it's hard to... I don't think anybody's ever successfully done it. Like there's no... I don't know if there's any case law as far as something like comics yeah matt's uh hey matt uh matt on youtube says uh in advertising you can't even use the words in the style of in your pitch deck because if that's uh discoverable uh if you you get sued if uh people find out yeah yeah so it'll be interesting to see because this technology is not going away and if it's a if it's um it's a company that's not based in Europe and not based in the United States. And let's say it was based behind <laughs> the Iron Curtain. An um, island, maybe an, an island shaped like a skull. Right, exactly. Yeah. Pirate Island. Um, I don't know. I don't right. know. I mean, there's people are going to, once it's out, people are going to do it anyway, whether you'll be able to. Right. It, I mean, I, I, that, that's the part that is, is not, you know, that people can do it. It's more like uh, if there's a way to discourage it, you know, I think, you know, given that everything has, if there's a way to financially de dis disincentivize it, I think that's what I'm more interested in because then that will keep it from propagating and replacing artists, things like that. Like if the comic book conventions say, okay, this is artist alley. You can't have AI art in it. That would be like a legitimate thing. I would think that people could do. Um, you know, if you buy a booth, maybe they don't have a problem because there's a lot of stuff sold in the booths. I don't think people necessarily <laughs> love, but at least if Artist Alley, these, these little islands of creativity, if if those places can be protected from incursions by AI images, then that would be, I think, uh, at least a step in some in in some way to protect people. Well, if the person in booth A is being ripped off by the person in role C. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, no, but that's still, but it's still, yeah. But it, it, it at least it took a, some effort to rip them off. You, you know, I, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, there's all these arguments about derivative work and something that's in the style of something else. And you again, you can't own a style. And, and all these indie artists who are just trying to get by. Again, I, I have a whole lot of sympathy for everybody in Artist Alley who's just trying to cover the cost of their table. But. Um, I feel, and all the, and all, given all the trademark infringement that's going on in there, I, I neither here nor there. I really think, though, that if, if at least if the artist alleys at comic conventions said no AI artwork, that would be a wonderful step. I and think it, that's probably you'd hope galleries would you'd hope galleries would follow suit. Hmm? I, I think that that's going to I think that's going to happen. I think the fact that if if the if the convention opened itself up to knowingly let people come in who were infringing upon copyright that opens up a can of worms that they probably don't really want to deal with because the yeah. big corporations like disney know that there are people at those conventions that are infringing upon their trademark sure. but they look at it as a way of promotion but now it's just the point like you have a machine and you can go like, let's mix this all up and I can make any, you know, and then five minutes later, Duke, here's a print, here's a print and I'm making 15, 20 bucks a crack. No, because you did not pay a license for that. And the big corporations are forced, as I said before in the program in the past. You are forced to protect your copyright because if you don't protect your copyright and your trademark, you will lose it. Because eventually someone could say, well, hey, you didn't sue those other three guys and they made $4 million making illegal merchandise. Why are you coming after me? You know, you didn't you didn't protect it. So, um, right. you know, it's it, 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 it's all the stuff you have to deal with it, as far as technology. Every year, I think, as an artist, there's some thing. What was it, a couple of weeks ago? No more color erase pencils. Then it was the AI thing. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's always something that you have to 
deal with or might affect your it's always something yeah <laughs> something's going away something's being discontinued well, put, uh, well putting putting a button on this there was a comic book that was created by an artist who um uh, or creator. I don't. I don't know how much. I don't know if they're artists, but uh, a, a person put together. How about that? A, a, a comic book made up of AI imagery and added cop and submitted for copyright by the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress granted the copyright. Currently, the Library of Congress will not grant a copyright to AI artwork. And now the Library of Congress is rescinding that copyright for that work. And uh, so there are steps being taken. There are. There is. A push against it. It's still very much unexplored legally. But um, again, everyone check out Legal Eagles video. I think you'd find it helpful. Um, all right, Mike, you had a beautiful topic for tonight. I thought this was a great, a great idea. Uh, let me see if I pop up this graphic here. I think people can still hear us. Framing the shot. Let's get into it. <laughs> was that your cat? No, that was my chair. It should have been my cat, oh, but I, I'm okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, so we were talking uh, after last week's show, which people really seem to like, uh, judging by our numbers. Um, and I thought I would come up with a topic that really relates to what I talked about last week. Um, and as I was talking to Steve before we uh, went live, one of the things that I think happens especially like when you're in a school or a learning environment is it's really easy to sort of think of everything as like being these separate subjects but the fact is that everything is all connected and when you study a subject you may do good on this one and not so good on this one um, and with something like comics each part of the process, each part of the baking, I always think of comics as sort of like baking, you know, it's like making a, making a cake, uh, you know, uh, each part is important and supports the other. So I thought uh, framing the shot would be a good subject because it relates to what we talked about last week. And it also, I think, is something that, uh, again, is very important regardless of style, right? When you're, when you're telling a story, um, how you choose to tell the story and the way that you choose and why you make those choices are really really important so let me see here I, let me get my uh and for framing the shot you're talking about that kind of i, I talk we i've often not heard it talk about this the camera angle the it's basically how you crop the image the, the 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 perspective of the viewer looking into the scene is that is is there a is there a more succinct way of describing what we're talking about yeah hold on a second i will we go to my first slide so if you can bring that up Okay. Um, so really, when you're a, a storyteller, um, you're making a series of connected frames or compositions. And can, you zoom can you zoom in on that, Mike? Let's see. Whoa, whoa. Better? Perfect. Okay. Um, And how do you make your story interesting, right? Because the whole point of telling a story is you want to make it interesting so people keep reading, right? And then everything that you do as an artist is becoming more successful or better at making your story more interesting, right? So how do you make your panel or compositions interesting? You know, you want to frame the scene or the panel for the ma maximum focus on your story to make it clear, make it exciting, and make it entertaining. Because it's the only reason why we read comics is they're entertaining. It's the same way we wa reason why we watch we watch movies. So, sure. um, the first thing is 
You're like, where do you put the camera? What are you focusing on? Where do you put it in the, and where you move the camper, the uh, camera or the viewer's eye, uh, it affects the shapes of things in your composition, right? It affects all the elements, high, put it high, do you put it low? Um, and then that works with what is the point of the panel that you that you have? Is it two people talking? Is it somebody punching somebody? Is it something blowing up? Is it somebody spying on something? What is the point of the, what's going on in the panel? And your, your composition should work with presenting that aspect of the story, the mood, the scene or the action in the best way possible. Now, I remember uh, reading that Joe Kubert would often say, you put the camera where the camera wouldn't be, right? You would put a camera, like he would put a camera down by somebody's elbow or he would put it hot. He had a, uh, and I, I learned actually, he's one of the people I learned the most about, I would say, of page layouts. Because he would do something, would be like a worm's eye view, very low, looking up. And then he would do what I would call like the toothpick people shot. He would do something very high, way above it. And he would literally look like a little toothpick people, right? So he would, do, he, would, he would really move the camera around or put it really close to somebody's face, you know? Um, and so... Uh, the uh, primary concern you have in the beginning is uh, how do you create interesting compositions that support the story? And a lot can of... We, can I ask you, Mike, about that? Put the camera where it wouldn't be? Yeah. So what's, what's, the, what, what's the thinking there? Is the idea that... Is there anything specifically comic-y about that? Or is that something you do as a cinematographer? As, or is the thought being that, hey, we're cartoonists, we can put the camera, since it's any, it, we, you know, we have some liberties that people who have to deal with reality don't. Yeah, I um, think I think part of it is not to be literal. Um, and I also okay. think that, that uh, and to be poetic and expressive in a way, in a comic book, it's much easier to do than it would be in live action right you could do it in animation right but there's certain physical realities to filming something live action that you cannot do in the same way that you can do in a comic book right on a comic panel you can do something very expressive like kirby or cuber or, or, you know, you could, you, uh, you know, somebody like Jerry Grandinetti who did these really trippy, warpy compositions. It'd be really hard to do that as easily or well in some ways in film than it is as a drawing. So, right. um, that's great. That's great. Right. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to take you off your, no, 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 uh, no, no, no. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a good point. So, um, I would say, you know, I would, when I would teach a class, I would tell people, you know, just get out a sheet of paper once you figured out what your story was and just draw like a six panel grid. And I do that for a lot of beginning people because they get so worried about what to draw and there's a lot of snags and, and hookups. So I say, put your idea down. If it's good, it's bad, if it's weak, just get it down on paper because one of the things about having an idea when it's in your head, it's kind of like a dream. The edges are fuzzy, you know? When you put it down on a sheet of paper, it's, oh, okay, now I can see it. And I th think of that part as sort of like visual clay, you know? Um, because then once it's on paper, not in your head, it takes on a physical property, right? Now, you, the next thing is you start to study 
your idea. Uh, like those old directors, um, you know, skip down a little bit. Like what you would see in the old days, you would see guys like, oh, here's a Stanley Kubrick and uh, Mr. Freeze, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Otto Preminger. Um, and you would see in the old days, you would see these directors walking around with this director's viewfinder. And they would be walking around the set and they would have the people, the actors standing there or stand in standing there. And they'd be like, oh, we'll move this around, move this light over here. Because everything in film is creative, right? Just like in a comic book, everything in film is artificial, right? Um, and it, it's like a magical spell, <laughs> you know? And so, uh, you have to sort of do the same thing that a director does. You get it down, get it on a sheet of paper, and then you start thinking like, okay, what do I need to show? And why do I need to show it? Is it better if I put this person closer? Or is it better if I pull away? Is it better to be above it? Is it better to be a low, be, to be below it? You start putting your 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 designer's hat on, right? Um, but like I said, nothing is accidental especially in comics and even more in film because, you know, you can draw a universe on a sheet of paper. It's pretty cheap, right? But when you're doing something that's like a movie, it is, you know, $100,000 a second for some of these effect shots. I mean, it's just, it's incredibly expensive and you have zillions of people working on a film. You know, you look at the end of the Avengers films, there's just like hundreds of people's names scrolling by. Right. Right. right? We as cartoonists are fortunate because we can just be one person and do all that. Right. But <laughs> nothing. That's nothing a, I like that. I like that looking at it like that. We're very fortunate. Very yeah, fortunate to yeah, we're very fortunate. I mean, one person can do a comic book that contain, you know, millions of characters and planets and all kinds of, you know, uh, world building, right? You can't do that in film. You cannot do Star Wars with one person. Right. You can't Take do that. Really. Yeah, you know. So, <laughs> but everything is intentional, right? Or is it, it's an informed choice. So there's nothing lazy in the planning. There's no... Well, I'm just going to draw this over here, and then like, no, well, what goes over there? What's the, what's in the background? What's what's the character doing? Where where are they sitting? You know, what time of day? Well, you know, I'll just kind of come back later on and figure it out. You can't really do that if you're going to produce a story, right? Um, so everything is important: the positive, the negative, the the uh, the figures, the backgrounds. Um, it's all important. It's all choices. Everything you're making, whether you're choosing to show it or to not show it, and how you're showing it is a conscious choice. So once you have it down on paper and you figure out what your where your story is and you're starting to think about like, oh, okay, I'm going to move the camera around. I'm going to put this here or there. Get your reference. That's the next step is getting your reference. Um, that's a very important step because, you know, um, comics is drawing on demand. And what do you mean by that? What do you, what do you mean by that, Mike? Because it's it's stored information. It's stored. It's stored. You know, when you to to learn how to draw a hand, you have to draw a hand enough times and study the anatomy. So the hand's in your head. So when you say, I'm going to draw a hand, you know, you go to your artist's memory bank and, oh yeah, I have the information on how to draw a hand. But if I say, okay, I want you to draw Batman running in a chemical plant. Well, you know, you probably don't have a chemical plant in your brain. And y'all, you, know, you might be able to, in a cartoony sense, be able to do that. And you, or you might be like, one in a million like Kim Jong-ji or, you know, Kirby or a few people who might have a 
a talent for being able to, or that ability where they have sort of a photographic memory where they see something and they can pull those shapes out of their imagination. Sure. But most people don't. And most people have to build up to it. And even if, you know, and in the case I think of uh, Kim Jong-ji, he specifically worked to train his brain to be able to do what he did. Right. So, um, and then there's the formal aspect uh, that we tend to work in three layers or visualize things in three layers in comics. Things that are in the foreground, things that are in the middle ground, things that are in the background. Right. Now, depending upon where you put the camera, high, low, where you place it in the space you're creating, you're drawing, it's going to change the shape of things. It's going to change the shape of the table. It's going to change how big something is, how small something is. Okay. So this is where the fun part comes in. Are the shapes created by the angle you have chosen interesting or can they be made interesting or arranged in a more intentional way? make the scene better or more dynamic, less literal, and more poetic. That comes back to that quote by Kubert, put the camera in an interesting place, an unusual place, right? Now, sometimes in a panel, you might only have one level. You know, it might just be a talking head, right? And then there's a word balloon. So you're, you're not going to be dealing with something in front or something behind. Uh, sometimes you only have two levels where you might have a figure and maybe a little bit of a background or maybe a little bit of a foreground. You won't be dealing with three, three layers, but I'm going to show examples of all this, uh, tonight. And can you frame the scene and characters in the foreground or do you frame it with a background element? Right. So, um, let me scooch down here um so the oh, idea this is, is this is gold mike this, this is gold this that my idea is that i sort of have a checklist right when i'm working now sometimes when i read a script i'll get an idea right away and it just ooh, the idea just sings out of my head but sometimes i don't have a a real strong idea. So then I'm thinking, I get my little director's viewfinder out and I think, well, okay, what's going to be interesting? Do I put something, some shape from the machines or some shape from the jungle, something in the room to give me an interesting foreground shape, to give me a little, you know, to create a sense of depth? Do I do something with something in the background? Uh, do I, you know, I have like a, a list, a checklist of, of things that I can think about that might help me solve a problem. And I, I sort of, I talked about this before on the podcast. So what I call fl uh, uh, flying by instrument when you're a pilot, right? So when you're a pilot, if you can't see because of the weather or it's too dark or whatever, you're supposed to be able to look at your dashboard and your aircraft and go, okay, you know, we're going fast enough or high enough, you know, all these things telling you about the, the engine and the, and the, 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 uh, the uh, altitude and the, the, all the aspects of the aircraft in the air. And maybe because I was self-taught, probably because I was self-taught as far as being a cartoonist, I learned these things uh, sort of like a pilot where, you know, I would say, here's a little checklist of things, you know, looking for tangents. Is the anatomy good? Did I make the, is the storytelling clear? Did I use an interesting uh, angle? Did I use a poor angle? Did I use a boring angle? I have a little, little checklist of all these things that I can go over to help prompt me come up 
prompted me to become up with a better solution. Um, and so here's some, just a few of them, not all of them, but just a few of them, you know, is there's something complex in the frame against something that is simple. That's all right. right. Is the con, is there a contrast in the value, a contrast in shape, you know, um, like a silhouette? which is something that's very, very effective. Um, a frame within a frame. Uh, one point perspective into a panel that is stopped by another object or uh, a sh another shape. One of the things about comics is that it's on a 2D, you know, it's a flat surface. And so you're creating the illusion of space by the arrangement of your composition, line weight, texture, all those things we've talked about before. Um, cast shadows, using shadows to frame things, uh, black areas of complexity and texture against something that is simple. Contrast, like I said, in, in shape size, study the grates and create a folder with panels uh, that are examples of these ideas I'm talking about or ones that you find interesting and then do sketches from them and study them um and it could be it could be an, an oil painting it can be a comic panel it can be a frame from a movie but these are these are images that you find compelling and then again it's not enough just to collect them and like oh i have a folder of I have a folder of images, right? I just have all this stuff. Oh, I like that. You know, oh, I like that. Oh, I like that. You know, everybody probably on their computer has stuff they've saved. Oh, I thought that was cool, right? That the the I thought that was cool folder, right? Yeah. Um, but it's not enough for us as artists. It's not enough for us people who are making things to like it. The lay person gets to like it. The person who is a professional cannot just like it. And you have to know why you like it. And you have to know why it works, right? And the only way you really know as an artist if something works is to draw it. You know, if you draw it, you analyze it. And several things happen when you draw, right? One you break it down and it goes in your brain in a couple different ways. It goes into your brain as practice, muscle memory. It goes into your memory bank of for recall later, right? Um, you draw it, as I say here, to recall it. That's great. That's great. You know, um, so this is just a list of some of the things that I use. I love that. I, I, would you would you uh, would you be willing to share that on your social media at some point? Sure. Yeah, I will put this up. Uh, I'll put this up later. I'll put this up on my Instagram and on my uh, and my Facebook. and that's Instagram. Uh, draw manly. Draw manly. Right. Right. right draw yeah. manly at on Instagram. Well, right. Mike, before we get into this, uh, let me just, uh, I want have, we got a couple of questions sure. uh, from uh, the room. And uh, uh, I just want to remind everybody, if you're watching this on Facebook, please click the, the like buttons, the heart buttons, all that other stuff. And if you're watching it on YouTube, again, please hit the subscribe button. We still have our goal of 1,000 subscribers before Jamar comes back. Uh, but or maybe he'll some... just say, no, I'm not, I'm not coming back until <laughs> I, I get 1,000. No, he, he, oh, no, no, he knows, he knows we miss him. Uh, D. Brad Gibson on uh, Facebook asks, "What do you think of Wally Wood's twenty-two panels that always work?" Uh, well, that basically is his version of sort of what I'm talking about, right? Um, the 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 beauty of someone like Wood was that he was very analytical in his approach and very systematic. Um, about how he did things, basically because at that 
point in comics, you know, you made your money by how many pages you could produce. And he had a very analytical brain where he would say, you know, a close up, you know, a talking head, a far away shot, right? Every artist has their version of Woods 22 panels. He just put it down, right? But I'm Neil Adams. He, was working, he had a studio with younger artists in there too. So I'm sure it was also a cheat sheet for them. Right. Right. I mean, one of the things he would do, he had another saying, you know, don't, uh, don't draw it if you can copy it. Don't copy it if you can cut it out and or trace it. it. Or trace, trace it. it. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> above all, don't try to draw because you probably can't. So uh, he, you know, he reused shots. He reused art. He reused techniques. Um over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know, there were stock, there's sort of like stock Wally Wood shots. Many of them were him swiping. Hal Foster. Yeah, they're, they're Hal Foster shots. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and he would, you know, he would figure out his story, he'd figure out where, uh, where to use it. Part of it was to sort of just speed up the process, you know. Um, are there any other questions? I can't oh, yeah, yeah. That. Uh, let me see up here. Uh, we were talking about, uh, when we were talking about the, the, just what the basic thought behind all this was and what the, what, uh, uh framing the shot was David, uh, Peterson came in from YouTube saying, uh, discussing yeah, it's where the artist is manipulating the reader's eyes to what the artist thinks is most important in that panel. I thought that was a, I thought that was uh, definitely on the same page with you there. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the point is, when you're reading a comic, I always say it's like watching a film. There's a magical moment in which you are, you know, when you get your comic out, you know, you come home and you're got your bottle of Coke and eating your hot dog or whatever, and you're reading, you're reading your comic book. You go from looking at drawings and words on a sheet of paper, and you fall into the story. Yeah. You fall into that world. It's like a magic spell has been cast and if something goes awry maybe a bad drawing or unclear layout does you know you kind of fall out of the spell the spell becomes weak yeah sure <laughs> you know um in the same way in a film you know we all I watched a film and then all of a sudden I was like, what the hell is that bullshit? Right. Well, that, right. That, that's, that's horrible. Right. And then that's it. It's like, it's kind of over the game over then. Right. You, Cause you never, you can't really ever recover from that, you know? Um, and so, yeah, you're, 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 and you know, you're also teasing people, you're leading people, you're you're keeping people interested. You're keeping people excited. You know you're doing all these things all at the same time. Right. All right. So, so looking at this first example, walk us through this one. So uh, this is just a real quick example of foreground, middle ground, background. Right. You got the the weird skull guys in the foreground. You've got the heroes in the middle ground. And then you have a background of the uh, ruined castle in the in the sky, um, and you know this is sort of a uh, a box in a way, sort of a, what I call like a box composition, because the 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 staff and the castle sort of create borders on either side then you have the border at the bottom of the rock wall or whatever and then you have the clouds at the at the top right and then if you dutch angle things a little bit you force the perspective that's not true perspective it's what i call a forced perspective uh, and then you have all the little swords everything is sort of pointing right to look at the you know the he heroes jumping at you again that's all done blatantly on purpose every line on there was done on purpose right the angle of the clouds the angle of the swords you know the angle of the little rocks everything you know even the 
even the lines on the on the uh, uh, bricks point towards the center of interest. So everything was intentional, right? Everything was intentional. Um, when you do something like a, you do splatter as a technique or something, well, then you're asking for an accident. You're purposely choosing to use a technique that will give you something random. But there's nothing random in this particular piece. Everything was very planned, right? And everything was very, was very considered. And so all those negatives, the negative space is just as important as the positive space, especially when you start getting something that's more complicated, because then you want to avoid having tangents. You want to, you know, you want a good overlap. Like his boot, uh, you know, his boot clearly overlapping, right? This clearly yeah. overlapping, clear, clear, very clear shapes, right? And if you don't make those choices uh, correctly, then, you know, if I put this so it's touching right there, not overlapping, well, then it just sort of becomes confusing, you know? Yeah. So, um, now this is an old, old layout from when I was working on Batman. And so when I would get a script right away, what I would do is I would start, images would pop in my head. And so I would jot down the images. And then I might do another layout after this. Now, the one of the things about the, the working with Doug Mensch's scripts that they were full scripts. So you had all the word balloons and sort of told you how many panels, although you were still free to combine a panel or eliminate a panel, as long as you kept all the script. Right. Um, so um, I was thinking of how I frame the shot. Right. And using the lighting using perspective again going in perspective going and then it sort of stopped by this so you've got a dynamic going in uh, and then another dynamic a frame within a frame within a frame so i was thinking about those shapes and you know how i can sort of you know sort of do like a film noir again where do i decide to put my camera right i'm low almost on the water in this, which gives me this dynamic shape, right? Here, I'm a little bit above, I'm above the, the cop car, right? But it allows me to do this shape leading me back into the, you know, towards the, uh, the boathouse, right? Because I'm gonna go here, right? I wanna go right to that boathouse. So these are very, and then here, you know, an upshot in framing. So here, uh, the next frame is actually the actual page. Oh, that's great. Can you zoom, zoom in on that one, too? Yes. Yeah, excellent. So this is the... Uh, result of working from my thumbnail. I don't think I did another... I don't think I did on, on this particular one, but sometimes I would do a rough thumbnail like that and just try to figure out the, the shapes, you know, like uh, you can see I went from, you know, this sort of abstract blah, blah. I wanted something here in the foreground to frame and I wanted to frame the cops, but I didn't want to draw the cops real small. So I decided to make them a silhouette, right? I love that uh, wide shot there. I love that. You have these figures in the foreground holding their weapons and the the cop car. Just enough of a cop car that you know it's a cop car. Right. Uh, and you you sort of read it in this way of you have this whole this and the color is fantastic too. The reds holding the foreground together, and then almost like the last thing you see in that panel is Batman on that roof. It's the very right. last thing. You, so you're you're sort of experiencing it from the uh, the the police's perspective or the security guards. I don't know who those are in the story, but whoever those 
people are, their perspective is, you know, they don't see him sneaking in and we as the readers almost don't. It's excellent. Right. Well, thank you. Uh <laughs> No, I, I love I love it. It's like one panel is telling one is, is telling a, a, a little story into it, enough, you know, itself. Right. Well, I I always love these deep focus panels, you know, where you get to see the character and the environment and you know, make the environment interesting. And then you have to again, you have to start making choices, right? If I draw the whole cop car, well, that's not what's really important in the scene to see the so what do I, I how do I frame the police car to give me just enough of a to let me know it's a police? So the most of the most iconic part of a police car, the thing that is the the sign, you know, the 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 bubble, you know, at the yeah yeah at the top. Um, here is an idea. This is a refined idea. Refined shapes. Everything is re considered. Even these little pieces of paper, you know, newspaper blowing through the scene carry your eye along so those are very conscious decisions to uh you know work to work that way well, there's a question from d brent uh asking uh did you do you plan the shot knowing where the narration or dialogue is going to go yes how much so because you had the full script to work from right when you gotcha got it right now if if i was if i you know like when i work with the danny finger off on dark Hawk, I would do my layouts and then I would send them to Danny and he would write after we rewrite the dialogue and all the specific stuff after I did my layout. Right. Um, I tend to like marbles, the marble method more because it allows me to play around with things more. Right. But, you know, on the Phantom, on the comic strip, uh, Judge Parker, I have full scripts. So, you know, it really, you know, you might, I, I think it's better for action to work with the Marvel method. But uh, yeah, that's something you take into uh, consideration. And also, Ken Brusenak was such a great letterer. So, um, yeah. Um, again, another page from Batman, you know, again, totally distorted, crazy perspective. Um, but framing him, you know, and then framing Bruce falling with all the bats, framing him with all these sort of scary bat shapes. And in fact, I didn't really want to draw all the, you know, millions of bats, because when you think about bats, you just think about all the shapes of the wings flapping, right? You think about the chaos and everything. Um, And so here's a frame, uh, a long establishing shot from the Phantom. Um, and here's a reference that I used for that <laughs> shape of the steam plant, right? Um, so I had an idea. I wanted something interesting in the foreground. Uh, and, you know, comic strips is very, you know, space, real estate is super precious in a comic strip. I don't have a whole page to play around with. I got this little sliver, you know, like two business cards, you know, stuck together. Um, right. But I want it, what, you know, what can I put here that's going to be also an interesting shape, right? So one yeah, of the things sure. I do... One of the things I do when I read Tony's script is I go, okay, what do I got to draw this week? Like this week I got to draw barracks in a prison. And uh, I have to draw something that I've already drawn before, like a control room I've already drawn. But every week there's usually always something that I, something that I have not drawn before. So something I do right away is I spend the time to do my research to just give me the idea, you know, this is pretty complicated, right? No, I can't, right. right? I can't put all this in, but I can put some of it in, right? Just this sort of interest, and again, foreground, foreground, middle, background, right? And I frame the two main 
characters. And and he's really pops because he's framed by the shadows of the the cast shadows. So your eyes are sort of moving, you create this triangle. And in fact, an interesting shape that always works to me, making something dynamic, is to have a to have triangles. Triangles in your composition make your composition naturally more interesting because triangles are interesting shapes. This is kind of a triangle. This is kind of a sort of a triangle. This is a triangle. And so just those sort of those triangles and this boom leads your eye. I want your eye to go right here, right? I want you to go right, and then I want you to sort of stop here. So, uh, convenient steam, <laughs> right. Right. right? Right. So, can we jump back a little bit to that Batman page. There's a question from uh, this one? Chris, Chris Bailey. I went back one more. Uh, the color page. There's a question from Chris Bailey on Facebook. Hey, Chris. Uh, uh, Mike, Mike, why did you choose to have the guy with the gun on top of the narration bubble? I did. I drew him, and that's where editorially they decided to do it, right? Because you see, they moved. The, they could have moved this narration box against the border, right? And they could have moved this one, right? There's enough room. If you move this and this, you would have not had him go. But that is actually an interesting choice because it makes his his gun read the, the, the edge of his gun read and then you know they fit the balloons in that and this sort of these dynamics uh, do, do you and chris's uh, follow question did you like that choice that they made yeah I, it, it, it would work better than them covering the gun up yeah it almost feels like the word balloons are you have a foreground you have a background middle ground and foreground word balloon in that panel it's almost like the balloons are moving forward in space. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's very true. I mean, here, the fact that they don't attach the balloon or the narration box, I should say, to the border floats it. By floating it visually, it makes it stand out in front of Batman. You know, this, they had wedged it into the corner that air would go out and would feel, it would make it more static. It would make it more static, right? And just by angling this, it makes it more dynamic. It gives a little bit of energy to it, you know? Um, so again, these are all conscious choices. Um, if you have a really good letterer, which Ken was, he was a great letterer, you know? I knew where the balloons were going to go, but he was the one who would decide to make that, right? Which is a brilliant, a brilliant decision, right? So uh, what you're hoping, again, because this is like a, 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 a assembly line, you hope that the next person in the assembly line takes it and pluses it. Yeah. You know, is the inker plus it? Do I plus the script? Do I, does it, if I don't ink it and somebody else inks my pencil, do they plus it? Does the letterer plus it, right? And does the colorist plus it, right? Everybody should be plussing as we go step to step to step. That's great. Um, again, I sort of feel like this, there's elements in, of composition in this Darkhawk page that echo some of my ideas here of using these dynamic shapes pointing right at what's important, you know, which is the bad guy's uh, car, you know, um, frame within a frame, framing things, uh, Contrast and in, in lighting, uh, interesting shape in the foreground of the you know that the place that he's gonna Savage Steel is gonna sit down, um, and then an above shot, uh, 
and using the cast shadows and the and the uh, the uh, uh, shadows and the and the light to make it interesting to add a lot of um, mood and then I repeat that idea in the Phantom same idea different story different characters person car but the same idea of how to stage the lighting to make it interesting to make these shapes interesting right and i always sort of think that there's a an eye path that's kind of doing this it's kind of doing this reverse s it could be a shadow it could be the placement of a figure that flows i sort of feel like you I, I do I I want something like this to be going on in the page. And a lot of times by this point, it's sort of almost like an unconscious thing because it's like this shape feels good. Yeah, I like the way this is working. Yeah, this feels good, right? Um it becomes instinct, right? Um that checklist that I showed in the beginning, and I do have a checklist. Uh should be instinct but maybe some days you're just a little off or maybe some days you're like you're unsure so that you can kind of go down the checklist which can sort of help you um and then of course again studying other people having your inspiration folder oh yeah there was this shot by this artist or there's there's something they did and you know take it steal it use it take the idea take the take the structure of it take the the building blocks of it and make it yours. So again, this is this is a a, 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 a reusing, like we talked about while they would reusing. I'm reusing ideas here that work. Right, right. I'm reusing ideas that work. Um, if I want to see the phantom following this guy down the hallway and they're in a, you know, a spooky old rundown prison, you know, if this was lit in a movie, they would probably have that key lighting. So your characters would walk through the key lighting, you know? So again, it's just an, an idea. And again, I, I would see films or other comics and that's an idea I'm sure that stuck in my head, I was just watching um, Odd Man Out. I think we talked about it last week, and I posted some frames from it on my Facebook. And there were many shots in there that were like this, people walking down the street at night with all this key lighting. And all that stuff was set up on like a, a British back lot. So everything was done on, on purpose. Um, Again, deep perspective. And, you know, when you're drawing a jail, it's just drawing. You're drawing people in bars. It's just a certain amount of technical drawing to space the bars. But then, you know, bars against bars. So boxes within boxes, texture within texture. One texture against another texture. All this helps create a sense of, you know, being in prison, claustrophobia, and it reads visually. I'm always trying to come up with things that will read in a second. You know, when the reader looks at it, they get it. They don't have to think about it, they get it, right? And then you see the, um, the final version. Then there's the black and white version, and then there's the final colored version. And I don't have the control of the coloring in the way uh, I would like on the on the strips. So I have to make sure that it works well in black and white. Um, and I knew that I was going to use Zipatone to have his shadow get darker towards her and lighter as it went away. But one of the things about 
doing this panel that I, I like the, the dynamics again, something going in and then being stopped. But I also had to make sure that this would read between those bars and this space would read between right. those bars, right? So where I, you know, it's always sort of a tricky thing. You draw the person and then I would sort of draw one square. Or two and squares. Having, to, have, having to make that work within that incredibly horizontal, very short space is it's you you had that with the the phantom on the previous panel and you know he's he's you had to have him sort of bent like he's 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 running i wonder how that affects the phantom's posture like it's almost <laughs> like he's gonna like he needs a tall panel just so he can stretch his back a little bit from time to time right well again you know i wanted i this is the cubert thing put the camera where the camera wouldn't be you know most time when people take a picture with their camera he's not laying on the ground so if I go down the sort of the worm's eye view and he's running forward like a, you know, like a fullback, you know, it's dynamic. Anytime you drop the camera down, you know, below things and makes things monumental, it makes it more dynamic. Uh, and then you have, you know, then I can get these bodies if they're laying on the, on the ground in the foreground, right? I can get them in front of him. And then That's I can great. use these this little pattern of the shadow, so you sort of feel like zoop, you go right in, you go you go right into yeah, the, go right into the door. So I'm constantly thinking of things like that. How can I frame this? Can I use a shadow? Do I need perspective? What can I you know what should I use to make this work dynamic and interesting? You know, um, here's a, you know, and something in Judge Parker, no, nothing ever gets dynamic, let's say, in Judge Parker. It's, it's not, you know, figures fighting and, you know, uh, you don't get, a, I don't get often a chance to use a lot of mood uh, because it's, you know, it's like a soap opera. So, um, but in this panel, I can make an effective choice of how I shape that shadow to frame Abby on the bed again here. This all becomes sort of a, a frame for the character. And if she's these organic shapes against these vertical shapes, it tends to make her look more sexy. You know, so there's little things like that. And like I said, sometimes I'm not aware of it. It becomes like, a, oh, yeah, it's like, you know, like cooking, like, mm, yes, that's good. Or, no, <laughs> it needs a little right. bit more sugar or no, it's got too much salt. Right. Um, if you train your instincts, you uh, uh, study why you like something. Uh, I always remember, like, Adam Hughes had great sketchbooks. Steve Rood is probably, I think, the best example people have seen his sketchbooks, where he was always doing stuff like that. He was analyzing why he liked stuff. He would do a drawing or draw many drawings to analyze something, why he liked that, right? And then once you understand it, then you can, like, absorb it, and then you can recall it. That's great. Um, Another clear example of framing, you know, the phantom and devil are going through the, uh, the forest, something in the foreground, clearly in the foreground, and then the arrangement of the trees as a framing device, and even a little bit of this fog, right? So... This nice little sort of triangle, and then you're sort of bordered in here. And again, this is all very conscious. Um, you know, I wanted to put a leopard in there. And again, you know, one of the things about comic strips, you, you have to really condense 
things quite a bit. Um, and just by having these vines be a little bit more organic, it adds a little bit more interest, right? And just the description of that panel would have broken other cartoonists, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we want the phantom on a horse, and he's got a wolf. He's going through a jungle, and there's a a panther in the foreground. The whole idea is it's it's so much in such a small space, and it's, I really think that's a excellent, uh, that's perfect framing of the shot right there. That's just great. Well, well, thank you. But and, and if I remember correctly, a lot of times Tony may not have actually said that there's a panther on a you know watching the, the phantom. That might be something that I come up with. He might say the phantom and devil are going through, you know, right through the swamp, right? And then I think, well, how can I make this more interesting, right? Now, a thing you would see in a lot of old classical comics is you would see, uh, and again, this is a classical use of foreground object, animal, bird, uh, lamp, uh, steam pipe, right? Something in the foreground to, to set the character back. And you want to make that an interesting shape. So this is the three, the three levels, the foreground, the middle ground, which is, uh, 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 the phantom, uh, and devil. And then the, the background. So um, I'm always trying to think of things. And then, you know, if it's a Black Panther or if it's night, I have to choose it at an angle that will read. So, you know, okay, that's not a dog, you know. Right. And if you, and if you had show, if I had chosen an angle that not, that did not clearly show his head, it may not have read as well. Um, here's another uh, example of uh, using a shape like a certain. There's this. So she's writing. Heloise, his daughter, is writing her memory of fighting or her a nightmare of her being thrown from an airplane which didn't happen, but she imagined it. She had a nightmare of it. And so, um, again, I want a dynamic of some perspective, but then think like, well, I wanted to sort of make it kind of dreamy, you know? Um, and so I used the clouds and I was thinking very much of somebody like um, Gene Colan, who was always great at like drawing these vaporous swirling shapes especially in like when he would did dracula or uh, dr strange so again it's not a literal thing right it's not a literal thing it's a poetic thing that's great another you know shadow a little bit of smoke frame i frame him clearly against that um, I want you to see in a second, you know, there's a guard down there, somebody walking, um, more clear, simple framing, uh, something in the, clearly in the foreground. And I think I added a lot of black and I didn't put the black on the pencils, get very clearly framing him. These sh shapes of the leaves and the trees, all the little intervals of that, I want that to be very clear. And I spend a lot of time, you know, trying to make these shapes, you know, look like a forest. There's a clearly a designed cartoon forest. But I can tell you from having spent a lot of time doing landscape painting, that definitely comes in to help me inform my designed trees and i do look at real trees i always look at like where tony describes the different 
environments, I will try to find uh, uh, photos of an African veldt or, you know, a African forest and really look at the rhythms and the shapes of the, of the trees. But even like deciding where I want to break the fog so that he stands out, you know, yeah, this excellent. is a level. So foreground, middle ground, background. And this is basically foreground and background. But again, all these shapes become very important in how his face is framed. And here's another, you know, classic uh, tree in foreground framing the prison. Uh, trees framing, tree framing the phantom and Ma's talking. So I think a lot about like visually how quick and how clear will this idea be, right? So I looked at, you know, real African trees, you know, to get what their shapes are like, you know, how the branches work. Um, and then, you know, I, I bend them to my will. You know, I bend, I literally bend them and put the shape where I want it. So I'm very aware of this shape and then this shape and this shape, right? This shape and then these shapes, right? And I don't want to make all my trees the same. I don't want to make all these shapes. I don't want to make this shape, you know, or this, this negative shape, right? So the negative shapes are really important. They're really important. That's why I dutched this hill a little bit and dutched this hill a little bit and then dutched this hill. Those shapes are very important because they sort of add a little bit of a dynamic rather than just it having been just a straight, flat, you know, flat land. Um, so I'm always really thinking about like, if this is a nice frame. And then there's going to be word balloons up there so i'm thinking like well even if that's covered up right right it, it will still be a good frame oh, Mike, then, I got a question. we got a question from youtube it's a, a jamar from youtube uh who's asking uh, ah. can mike can mike explain why he draws so many elements in the pencil stage when you're just going to ink it like shading in the backgrounds and trees instead of just using x's that's a good example with that bottom panel uh with the phantom uh, his face is sort of his ha part of his head in the previous image. His part of his head is silhouetted against the tree, and you've shaded it all in. Are you are you are you figuring out where the shading's going at that moment, or are are you are you testing it in practice at that moment, or is there another reason? Well, sort of all of the above. One reason why I pencil the backgrounds tightly is if I'm not inking them myself, and my assistant Liang is inking them. Well, I can't expect her to make up that stuff, but know where, know where to put put things and where, where my intention are. So these were inked by her, so I pencil tightly. And sometimes the only way you really know if something is going to work is to draw it, is to actually sit there and put the shadow in, you know, put, put the shadow in, right? Um, so, you know, sometimes I can get away with it, like pfft, X, okay, I know this is all going to be black. That's simple, right? But I didn't, this is not just a simple tree. Right? It's just not a, a simple tree, you know. Um, there's texture on it. There's this rhythm, this little shape going over, leading your eye back to the phantom, right? All this stuff is is design considered you know how i do these the branches over over you know wrapping around each other um if liang is going to ink that and i just kind of scribble something well it may work or it may not work so i have to really kind of do it you know i may not do it as tightly if i'm inking it myself or i might depending upon the situation sometimes you just like doing a drawing And more gale cells, right? But again, you know, thinking of framing, how do I frame the scene? You know, how do I frame this scene? 
I don't, you know, I'm drawing the, the, the bars, but I'm also trying to do that sort of film noir thing, you know, where you get the, the cast shadow and then the, those shapes are very mechanical against the organic, right? Yeah, that's great. And again, another dynamic, deep focus panel. And even this shape here leads you, leads you back. So this kind of stops you. So again, a, a dynamic perspective that's being stopped by a vertical or being stopped by black, but it pull it pulls you in, right? And so I'm trying to always find su supporting design ideas. Yeah, it, look, it also looks like th that that bottom panel looks like you left that upper right area for text like you like, i think you there's certain certain areas i can see like you're saying you know let's you know i, I don't have to i don't have to render every brick because there's gonna it's gonna be covered with a, uh, a big block of text right right and here's another uh here's one of my uh wind down drawings but again you know how i decided to frame things where i put the black again i i just very fond of these sort of like perspective pulling you into a picture. Um, there's a lot of little sub compositions within the main composition. So you have the big composition of him being framed, right? But then you have all these uh, secondary story composition. And then this is a composition. And then this is a composition. So when you have these these compositions within compositions, all of these shapes become very important because if something gets kind of funky, kind of it will kind of ruin it. It'll kind of ruin the whole the whole thing. Um, and I just pulled these in today. These uh, I saw these on the Leonard Star Facebook group, and he is one of my favorites. That guy was just so fantastic look at this dynamic leading you right up to mary at the top of the steps again a far superior example than my crappy drawings i showed tonight <laughs> you know and then this great shadow here which also you have her gesture but that shadow has that gesture so just you know bam just pulling you and this just amazing design. You've got this dynamic tilt coming in, and then this dynamic design of the staircase. With and then, those activate with the activation dots. Right, exactly. Yeah. And then you have your white against black against tone, right? Vertical against black against white against tone. Look at the amazing depth. Your guy goes jump, 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 jump. You go right back. Just, oh. just amazing. Just do, you, amazing. do you think it's possible in that previous panel, just look at the lettering for a moment, that in panel one, I'm trying to figure out why the first balloon wouldn't be anchored to the top of the frame. Is it, do you think there's a, do you think there's a reason that the second figure is meant to be louder and more dominant? Do you think there's a, a logic to why the word balloon of the second figure is anchored to the top when the first one isn't. Yes, I, I think it. I think it actually feels. I've never seen that before, but it feels like that word "no." He's shouting over him. There's something about that that you read it when you see "no." Be back here tomorrow, Mister Cavello. Well, I also You're think this this relates all the way back to this. It relates to creating a sense of air. Same thing is going on. Same thing is going on by you floating this balloon down a little bit. You open that up, and you and it doesn't feel as flat because the shape continues all the way through. So you feel this creates a sense of space in your mind, in your eye, that if you That's move that balloon up like here. You don't feel that space. You feel the space here. You don't feel the space as much here. 
what you feel is border, like this borders, right? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I think I think that's why he he did it. You know, and again, classic foreground shapes, just beautiful use of cast shadows, texture, you know, direction, great framing. Again, another just fantastic background. I used to have a guy named Tex Blaisdell who used to do his backgrounds. And uh, just, just fantastic work, you know. And again, very simple idea. The movie lights creating this sense of, even with just, just this crosshatch tone, right? But you really feel that every one of these shots, you really feel depth. Even in the simplest one, you feel depth. And then somehow that light right there stops you. So you focus on that guy's head. You focus on this. Again, nothing on any of these is accidental. Everything was thought out and intentional, right? He could have done a shot where you see Mary standing at the top of the steps, right? But he looked at that shape and thought, this is an interesting crop, an interesting frame. That's a very interesting frame. Yeah, her looking down and seeing that hand, really so good, so good. And it's sort of disorienting, you know, like, what? Yeah, yeah it's very kind of like disorienting. Because you, again, this is a, the relates to the Kubert quote, you know, put the camera where the camera wouldn't be. A camera would normally be here, and a camera, you know, would normally be here looking up the steps. The camera would normally not be above somebody's head looking down a flight of steps to see a hand do something. And, and what strip is this, Mike? This is uh, on stage. On stage. Which we were all very fortunate. The Classic Comic Press reprinted all of them. So, I mean, that uh, Jack Kirby, another, another saying, I know I've said it, I'm sure, on the podcast before. Jack Kirby had a saying that one man could be a, can be a school for another. And Leonard Starr is definitely one of those artists anyone anyone can learn from and i don't care what subject matter what style you're drawing in whether you're drawing you know little mushroom people or you're drawing any stuff all these things that i'm talking about these fundamental ideas i'm talking about work re regardless of uh of style you know again just great simple dynamic shape framing Doing the same thing, you notice that, Steve? Yeah. Lowering yeah. that balloon down, right? There's a, obviously a reason, you know. Uh, interesting object in the foreground. Characters are very clearly framed. You know, again, look how beautiful the, the composition within. Yeah, I, you know. I haven't looked at much of this. As a Toth fan, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the lettering's beautiful. Oh, it is. Yeah. And he, he, you know, he, uh, I'm not quite sure who lettered the strip. Um, ah, my window is giving me a fit. I, I, I hate, I hate this. Do you need to reset something? No, no. I think I think it's telling us we're at our hour and forty minute mark, Mike. I think that's what it is. Okay. Um, so just a, just a uh, couple more things here. We're pretty much good. now. When he stopped being on stage, Leonard Stark took over Little Orphan Annie, which was kind of a bizarre thing uh, because you would never think that he would do something like this. But look how amazing. The strip is. Look how amazing the strip is. Again, using all the things that I've talked about tonight as far as framing, uh, depth, you know? I mean, this is just a beautiful, a beautiful strip. I mean, these characters are pretty bizarre. But if you take away 
the bizarreness of her weird, you know, <laughs> barney eyes or what I mean. All the other stuff is just fantastic. She's an orphan, Mike. Quit picking on her. You know, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Another Frank Robbins, because he's one of my favorites. I mean, just look at the beautiful composition. Just that right there. That beautiful framing of the gun. Yeah. Right. And even how he frames her head with those balloons and this interesting foreground shape. Hmm. Right. There's nothing in any of this work I'm showing, you know, um, this, this great Millennium Falcon piece here. I, I was struck by this uh, uh, earlier today. Um, foreground, interesting shape. Middle ground with texture. Background, black. Forces you right down. And the thing that has the most texture, of course, is the Millennium Falcon. Right? So great framing. Great framing. And again, you know, Al's great at like, just dropping stuff out, just dropping out, dropping out things, just dropping out those backgrounds, just awesome framing, foreground, you know, bizarre root thing, you know, look at a beautiful, beautiful, just eliminating all this here. And you really feel the characters running, moving, which is yeah, beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. You know, um, and, and that, that second panel there where uh, Luke is grabbing something on his waist, that kind of just close that extreme close up of detail is so great. I I, I think that was one of the first things I, I thought when I, I was when I first started noticing Frey and, uh, you know, panel composition, not the, not the page composition, but the composing within the panel was when I saw somebody do extreme close up and it or it might have been something that almost was like. A non sequitur, kind of a just something there for for uh, tone, like Mike Mignola suddenly cutting to one of uh, you know one of the photos in the room. You're in a library setting, and suddenly one of the panels is just one of the photos on the desk, and it's just a creepy photo. And all it is is just to make you feel creepy. It's not a story point. It's right. a mood piece. It's a mood piece. But it's things like that where you know, you know, my com link it's gone. It's just a great scene. I mean, how do you? face in that panel at all but you can tell from the hands that they're there's a lot of language going on there a lot of storytelling right. and it's well i can also tell that those are al's hands <laughs> <laughs> um but one of the things um when you really are good at design and really good at framing uh and choosing how to frame things what you don't feel when you're looking at this is you don't feel anything is missing you don't go like, oh, wait a minute now. What the, why isn't there all this stuff here? Why isn't there all this stuff here? Why isn't there all this stuff here? Right? You don't, you don't feel anything is missing when you're looking at this work. Right? You don't feel that this is missing. These things are missing. Right? Yeah. Because if you're really good at design and at your choices, then this is not missing. This actually negative shape is highly designed. All this. So I think when you're when you're younger, as an artist, you're very concerned about the drawing of things, right? The drawing of muscles and hands and buildings and anatomy, and you know, you're very obsessed with the drawing of things, right? Um, and it's a good thing you brought up somebody like Mignola because he got better and better and better at this kind of stuff. If you look at his work now, he's so minimal. You know, he's 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 really hard. There's so little of what he draws as a thing. It's just beautifully designed shapes that are very poetic yeah there's toth line make it so simple you can't cheat and it was i mean to me it was like an argument against decoration but it also became a thing where it's like 
uh, these silhouettes often when I'm putting a silhouette in my comic. I sometimes feel like I'm cheating the reader. I feel like I'm, I could be packing it with more information. I could be showing every expression, but part of it is that, uh, if you do it judiciously, it tells the story in a better way. And then it, uh, it, it doesn't feel like you've taken an easy way out. Looking at that previous page, there's tons of silhouettes, but you don't ever think, oh, this is the artist phoning it in. You no. know, sometimes yeah. sometimes no. you can see a silhouette and go, okay, this doesn't seem like a lot of effort, but my goodness, there's so much work on those pages that uh, that, that that last panel of Luke climbing that rock is perfect. Right. Now, and the fact that you, that you silhouette him focuses on the monster, right? You focus on the monster. Again, you know, Al was a genius with this type of design, uh, this, the use of blacks, the use of white space. His use of negative space is is just superior. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I think that's why when he actually inked Mike on a few things like Fafford and the Grey Mouse here, they really connected in a way because they're both really exceedingly good at the use of shape, space. Negative space is a very important aspect in their work. Um, and they sort of have similar root artists in the fact that I think, you know, Mike was very influenced by uh, uh, Frazetta and Wrightson. Wrightson was very influenced by Frazetta. Frazetta was very influenced by Hal Foster. And Al was very influenced. He was a contemporary of Frank Frazetta, but he was also very influenced by Hal Foster. So there's there, there are root artists. Again, if you study, if you've got your, your folder full of stuff, <laughs> uh, right? You've got your folder of... of but again, if you start studying the artists, you will then find common artists or root artists. Yeah, that family tree, you can see, you can travel back and you can see that they're all related. Yeah, yeah. And I think in comics, especially, and it's not really that many steps, you know, it's not many steps from me to, you know, Wally Wood or Neil Adams or, you know, Jack Kirby and you know, from Jack Kirby to Milton Kniff, you know, it's literally like two, three steps and you get back to a root artist. Um, and I think that uh, we live in a great time for young artists to be able to get really good quality reproduction and collections of things like on stage or the, you know, Al's Star Wars stuff. I mean, all the stuff has been collected. So, uh, and, and so much of it is actually, you know, on online. And then the last thing, uh, these two last, a uh, couple last, great toast page. You know, talk about non-literal design. Look at that beautiful landscape up there, that tree, you know. Um with Zorro. So again, I'm thinking of things like that. Just this beautiful, beautiful shape. And all the intervals, all the negative space. The sweep um, of the of the woman's figure in that last panel is just wonderful. It's there's so much gesture there in just standing there. Oh yeah. It's, it's, yeah this S curve of a shape. It's, again, you know, one of my root major root influences was a guy like Wood. Absolutely. This is fantastic. Again, just look at, you know, I'm stealing this stuff in the Phantom. I'm stealing. <laughs> I'm just blatantly stealing this shape language from him. That is an amazing page. And a man. That's yep. amazing. Yeah, that's one of his, you know, this is one of his, I think, his, his best stories. I mean, just how beautifully everything reads. And he was like one of the best guys at being able to use Zipatone. You know. And it's so lively, and there's so much cartooning in it. That that uh, figure at that last panel, uh, just squeezing into the frame, and just perfect. And it's so it's it it's almost Jack Davis in how it's 
Well, you know what it is? It's Andy. It's, it's a Frazetta swipe from <laughs> Untamed Love of Al. That's amazing. Right? You know, there there and there's probably I'm sure that this is a swipe. Right? I'm and sure that that's probably the a swipe. Figure, the figure being picked up and thrown that I have there's a million dynamo panels from Thunder Agents. Right. That exact pose. Right. And again, now he's a guy who knows or knew, I should say, how to use a swipe. Right. Now most people are not as you know educated in the the lore, you know, and they, but of course as soon as I look at that, I go like that's a Frazetta figure, right? That's a <laughs> that's a Frazetta, that's a Frazetta figure, you know. Um so it's just it's in a way sometimes I think it's they're almost like funny little in jokes. Um here's a, something I came across. I think I was showing this to Mimi and Liang as a as an example of uh I can't remember the name of the artist now because it actually was not on the JPEG. But talk about beautiful shapes. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful, amazing, amazing shapes. You know, just, and this, you know, I don't know if this was originally in color or not, but I mean, just again, I look at something like this and I just like completely fall in love with, with this. You That's know, lovely. Um, writes in, you know, this dynamic shape leading you in, and then this frame. So you've got this very straight, mechanical kind of, and then these like weird, gloopy, you know, awesome, droopy zombies. But you go right through, boom, and then you're stopped. The contrast, you know, everything is just working so well in this drawing you know even almost you know you got like a a cross there as a symbol you know i mean it's just just fantastic um another you know great the summer circular composition he's fighting all these guys each guy reads roll and then you've got this pole this dynamic this the straight pole it's vertical, which makes Conan stronger by placing him against that strong vertical. And then you have this dynamic shadow coming in. Now, I don't know how, you know, tightly, you know, he penciled that. But, you know, this, is, this looks like it was inked by him. But, again, by putting that strong vertical there within that circle, it just you really feel like bam he's hitting those guys. Again, another great triangle composition, power composition. He's at the top. And then these great vert, you know, triangles framing that composition, which makes it much more dynamic. And then this guy sort of stepping in into the composition but this frame is very important it's very important in that composition you know um it's beautiful so these are the and then these last two are uh oh i forget the name of the artist now uh, bernard charavan and i came across these these are just fantastic mm. especially mm. this one this looks like something right out of the third man, you know. Um, so again, when I see something like this, that goes in my folder, it goes in my brain, it's gonna be stolen at some point. At some point, I'm gonna probably I'm gonna take this guy, I'm gonna take something like this, you know. I'm not gonna copy it exactly, but I'm gonna take that idea and I'm gonna use it. That's great. So all of this stuff is important you know all this stuff is very very important it's a, that was it, wonderful mike you know so um we don't have time left tonight or i would do a uh do a drawing but you might try something this would be a good example 
draw two hunters returning to their cabin. The cabin has like wood stove. Maybe they have, you know, hunter things in the cabin. And they're sitting at a table. And they could be talking. Now, I want any, anyone is free to draw that, sketch that up, and submit it to me. Send it to Mike at ActionPlanet.com. I will go over that, your drawing, and give you pointers on how I think you might be able to improve the composition. Or maybe it'll be genius right off, <laughs> right off the bat. But oh, so let me let me ask it. Let me, so let's let's understand that assignment. Two hunters have just come back from a hunt, and they're at a table and they're talking over the day. Right, they, they're having a discussion. Having a discussion. All right. Right. They could be eating. They could be talking. They could be, you know, cleaning their guns. They could be, you know, they're in a cabin. It's got what's in a cabin? You know, is it a fireplace? Is it a wood stove? They're, you know, they're sitting at a table, you know. Uh, uh, so take that idea because that that might be what you get in a script. The two people come back and, you know, they're they're having a discussion or an argument in a cabin. Then it's up to you now. Get your Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> and this you is know. just a panel. People don't people don't have to do a page. It doesn't have to be a page. Well, no page. It's just, just one. One panel, it could be square, it can be it could be know. a thumbnail, it could be just something to say, something that Mike can you gotta put some effort in it. Don't send me like <laughs> right, put some put, some, put you know, you want me to put effort into it, you gotta put effort. Into it. So you'll put in a commensurate amount of effort based on their effort. If they put in no effort, you'll put that right if in the track. If you don't put any effort in it, you're not gonna get an answer. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Mike, that was awesome. Uh, I, we want to do more of this. Uh, it's this is basically just an excuse to pick Mike's brain, his giant, giant brain. Uh, I love this conversation. I love seeing the examples. I love seeing the things that inspire Mike, because um, he inspires me. So everybody, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, again, please, I gotta beg again. Go to YouTube.com/slash/pencil to pencil and hit the subs uh, the subscribe button there. We want to get our subscribers up to a thousand. So when Jamar comes back, uh, we just have a big party. We can nice. carry him on our shoulders to, to the cheering crowd of thousands of people. Yes, thousands. Thousands shall await his return, yes. his triumphant return. Uh, if you want to find me online, my name is Steve Conley. I write and draw the webcomic The Middle Age. It's at middleagecomic.com. And uh, I've been doing some TTRPG stuff. So if you're into D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons, um, I make some, I've been making some paintings, some digital paintings and 3D models. So there's a, uh, we, we're talking about an upcoming episode, maybe looking at uh, running a Kickstarter, something of which I have some experience at. And so maybe we'll, we'll put that in experience. the hall. Yeah, lots of experience, yeah. But uh, Mike, where can people find you online? You can find me on Facebook at Mike Manley and you can find me on uh, Instagram at Draw Manly. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm pretty easy. If you throw a rock on the internet, you'll hit me. <laughs> You're fantastic. Well, there's was recent news that in America, they're going to be moving us out of the pandemic phase into the endemic phase. But currently we're in the pandemic phase yet as of, as of today. So uh, everybody at home, we're still in the pandemic. So please remember to wash those Kirby hands. And we will see you all next week on Wednesday. <laughs> how don't how don't Jamar click end broadcast when his hands are doing this, Mike? I don't. I you know maybe he's not using his hands. I don't. Ooh, ooh. Have a lovely week, everybody. See ya.